Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Britt. I'm from the Knox Arts and Events team here at Knox City Council. Um, I'm here today with um, Irene, Kerry and Melissa. Um, before we get started, I'll let you know that your cameras and microphones are turned off. So please pop any questions you might have in the chat bar. We will try to get to all of the questions that we can today. Um, so a recording of today's session will be available after the festival. So keep an eye on our website and social media pages for that. Um, our leading panellist for making your backyard and balcony buzz is Irene Kelly from Gardens for Wildlife. And Irene will be joined for uh, with Kerry Davis from the Australian Plant Hi. Society and Melissa Allen from the Knox Environment Society. So um, I'll just get them all to say a quick hello. Irene, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Welcome. Yeah. Hi, Kerry. everyone. Welcome to. Thanks, Kerry and Melissa. Hello, everyone. Fantastic, thank you. Um, now we do have a quick poll today just to get an idea for what kind of outdoor spaces you might all be working with. So I'll just get that happening for you. Just a moment. Okay, so you can see that poll is launched there. If you can all pop your responses in, it'd be great to know where you're all coming from. We've got a balcony, that's great. I'll share the results once they're ready. Um, but in the meantime, I'll pass over to Irene to get started. Uh, thank you very much, um, Britt. Uh, welcome to the session today on how to make your backyard and balcony buzz and how to nestle your home in nature. My name, as we've said, is Irene Kelly and I'm representing Gardens for Wildlife. And my co-presenters are Melissa Allen from the Knox Environment Society and Cares Nursery and Kerry Davis from the APS Foothills Group, Australian Plant Society. Um, so we're hoping we can answer all your questions today. And now over to Melissa and Kerry, who will tell us a little bit about the Knox Environment Society in the nursery and the APS Foothills Group. And also while they're on, share with you their pick or go-to species for a pot and a plot that will start any garden buzzing. So over to you, Melissa. Um, just, just quickly, sorry, Melissa, we've got our, our poll results in. It uh, looks like we're working with a few balconies, but mostly backyards for today. So that's really great to know. Thanks, everyone. All right, Melissa. Beautiful. All righty. So, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Melissa from the Knox Environment Society um, and Indigenous Nursery. So um, I've been a member of the Knox Environment Society for a bit over 10 years which is just a, a drop in the pond, really, because the, the organisation has been going for 38 years now in the local community. Um, we have a wonderful membership base, um, over 140 members now, and many of which are volunteers with us, which is fantastic. Um, and for those of us, you who haven't been to our nursery yet, it's based in Ferntree Gully, near the Ferntree Gully Library. So just off Burwood Highway here, you've got the Aldi on Burwood Highway. We're opposite that in the Wally Chew Reserve. Um, but I'll get back to the nursery in a moment. A bit more about the society first. We do a lot of great work in the local environment. We, a big part of what we do is campaigning to protect our local bushland reserves, our plants, animals, anything environmental. We, we like to try and do our best to protect it. We go out and we, we want to teach as many people as we can as well about protecting our local biodiversity. So we head out to events like Stringing Bark Festival. This photo here was taken at um, Knox Festival this year, just before, you know, lockdown hit. Um, we also get involved in uh, initiatives like the Repair Cafe, you know, trying to um, get sustainability happening on a local level. We also do presentations and workshops. This was a fun little event we did uh, last year. Our theme was, we had a Doctor Who theme just for some fun. Um, but uh, yeah, we had all kinds of different topics last year and we're hoping to get back into that again soon next year. We also do two big festivals on our nursery every year. We've got great kids activities. We invite local community groups like the Knox Community Gardens and the Knox, uh, <laughs> the Knox Toy Library come along. Um, and we have live music and lots of fun as well. So we get up to lots of different things uh, in the society, lots of fun. But um, obviously the biggest part of what we do is our Indigenous nursery. So we have a, a bunch of wonderful volunteers who help us out um, almost every day of the week. We have people doing different things at the nursery from propagation to seed collecting to 
gardening, all kinds of things. Um, but uh, for those who don't know, an indigenous plant as opposed to a native plant, it means it's specific to our local area. So a native plant means it's an Australian plant. Indigenous means it's specifically local to an area. So around Knox, we have around 400 different species locally, which is pretty impressive bit of biodiversity. Um, and that's fantastic because those species, they're used to our soil types and our climate conditions, which makes them drought tolerant and so easy to grow in your gardens. And that's what we want you to do. We're growing these plants so you can pop them back in your gardens and provide a little bit of habitat for, for animals and, and set, protect some species. But we do have a video as part of the String of Art Festival, um, which I'm hoping will be showing this afternoon, but it's gonna be up on the YouTube page. So check that out for lots more information on what we do. Um, but when you do come to our nursery, you, you're not just throwing at some plants and you have no idea what you're looking at. Our volunteers are always happy to help with your gardening and plant questions. A big part of what we do also is to protect threatened species. And I've just got a couple of photos of some of the species that are rare and endangered in our area. There are 78 species that have been recognised as rare um, and threatened. This is just some of them, and it would be an absolute, absolutely devastating to lose them in our local area. And this is what we want to try and protect. Um, yeah, so, whoops, hang on. I'm going to skip that one for now. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit about what we do. And I'm going to hand over to Kerry now to talk his bit. Thanks, uh, Melissa. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Australian Plant so Society Victoria and our prime aim is to dedicate to promoting and growing the conservation of Australian native plants in gardens, community areas and their original environments. And we have about 1,500 members in Victoria uh, which is broken up into uh, 29 district groups. The one I belong to is the Foothills Group. And we'd love uh, any uh, garden-minded person uh, to join our group and participate in our vision. Now. At our uh, uh, Foothills Group Day Meeting, we, uh, we have a day meeting and an evening meeting each month, uh, except for uh, a couple of months in the year. Uh, our, the activities that we uh, do at our meetings is we have expert speakers or hands-on workshops, Flower, flower displays and sharing knowledge. We also, uh, for example, uh, revegetate the uh, Knox Park Primary School, which has about seven acres. And other activities include garden visits, bush walks, uh, community plant sales, because we do our own propagation, and weekend gatherings of district groups every three months at different locations throughout Victoria, which are excellent uh, uh, items to do because uh, you get to see gardens all over Victoria. And we also have uh, study groups uh, for uh, different genesis. For example, it might be uh, wattles, gribertias, grevilleas, and during the time that uh, I was assessing uh, gardens for uh, wildlife, uh, I found that a lot of places uh, the blocks weren't too large and people didn't have trees. But there are uh, a number of small trees that you can use. For example, I've put one in here. It's a native frangipani. It'll grow to about eight metres high. This one's about 40 years old and it has uh, beautiful flowers and a beautiful fragrance. 
it's actually in flower at the moment. Now for people that like uh, shrubs in pots, I'll put an example here of a uh, baronia. Uh, some baronias or most of them are difficult to keep alive in, in gardens, but grow well in pots. Uh, uh, I'll hand over to Irene to uh, continue. Thank you, Kerry. I'd like to um, tell you something about, um, I'd like to tell you about the um, Knox Gardens for Wildlife program. It's a fantastic partnership program between Knox City Council, KES and the community. And it's a really a program that's been set up so that it can enable any um, resident, whether they're on a, have only got a pot or have a plot to provide, be provided with information about how you can garden for wildlife in your own space. And they'll actually send in um, some volunteers that'll help you to do that. And as a result of that, you will um, get some fantastic doable free advice on your own property that you can do in your own time. And the idea is to create um, stepping stones of habitat to link our remnant bushland um, places. Um, they do have some key messages to build that wildlife ha habitat. Unfortunately, many the, the greatest impact on our bushland places besides isolation is the impact of environmental weeds, which significant, significantly will reduce the space that the wild species can grow. So there are some key messages as part of this program, and we're not the weed police by any means, but what we're trying to do is give um, some balance back into our local nature by recommending that you, when you're using um, introduced plants, you consider the weed impact of them. So make some good choices. So we see that good, good is non-weedy introduced plants, even better is non-weedy natives because even some of our native species can become um, weeds in our environment. And I think Potosperm is a very good example of that where it's growing close, quite close in Gippsland, but when it's in our area, it invades our bushland. And as I say, has a huge negative impact. And the best we say is indigenous local natives, but we're not purists. It's about, as I said, redressing the balance. When you consider there's 28,000 introduced species in NOC, uh, introduced species in Australia, but only 16,000 naturally growing species, it's really important that we provide space, if we can, for our indigenous species to remain. Um, the program's been incredibly successful. There's 900 gardens in NOX and still growing. And when we look at the aerial shot of this bushland, we can see what scope there is in our urban environments, in our backyards to actually do something to link up the, what is becoming these isolated bushland places. So my recommended gardens for wildlife pot species today is Dianella species um, because it does attract the blue banded bee, which is a bee that's becoming very popular with people. And, if, and um, we're all familiar with the introduced European bee that pollinates our fruit and veggies, but this little bee is very handy around your um, veggie pot for your tomatoes because as a buzz pollinator, it's great for pollinating our tomato plants. Um, native bees are very interesting because they're often solitary, they're quite non-aggressive, and there's over 1,700 native bee species in Australia, so another whole species that we can find out about. And for the plot, I'd recommend sweet Bessaria because not only is it attractive to butterflies, this very large attractive shrub, but it's also a great um, habitat for small birds because it does provide shelter and security for um, the small bird and encourage them to stay in your plot rather than get driven off by the larger, more territorial birds who will guard the nectar or for that matter, give them some protection against cats. And if you um, combine it, this is the Basaria, the white one here, if you combine it with this Coria species, which is a native fuchsia, which is a great source of nectar for the birds, that gives it some, some feeding, some shelter, and then hang when it's mature with a hanging bird bar, then you've got this fantastic um, habitat for um, small birds and butterflies. 
And also, as Kerry was saying, there is a possibility to still have our home nestling amongst the gum trees because now there's dwarf or low growing examples of eucalypts available at specialty nurseries. And I encourage everyone to think about doing something like that. You would have seen from the overhead shot how many of our um, um, urban homes now don't have a, a tree in them and they don't have to be large trees to still preserve the character of what is not. So anyone can do it anywhere, just begin. So if you're by any chance coming from outside of Knox at the moment, there are programs starting across the state and Gardens Wildlife Victoria is the go-to place to go. You can find it on your website and the contact details I'll show later um, when I um, bring that, that a slide up. Um, so everyone can do it, just begin. You don't even have to be part of a program. Just think about some indigenous species and plant them in the garden. And these are some stories that are on the Gardens for Wildlife Knox website that you can have a look at and um, enjoy the opportunity to um, see how other people have and how it makes them feel so positive about their environment. And now I'd like to um, uh, share with you the contact slide so I just do that and find you the contact slide that you may wish to take a screenshot of um, or maybe you, um, take a photo with your phone of the various organisations that are featured here today in the Q&A and also um, in the Knox Gardens for Wildlife one if you think you're running out of a room I'd just like to make you aware that Knox Council now will give you a permit to plant up your nature strip and you will find the guidelines for that and how you go about it on that website there. And of course, there's Gardens for Wildlife Victoria. I encourage anyone who's outside of Knox to contact them and see if you can get a program either up and going in your area or connect with one that's already there. So thank you very much for that. I hope you've enjoyed our small presentations and we'd love to answer any questions that we can. We'll give it a red hot go. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, yes, everyone, please. We do have um, a bit of time left. So we'd love to have any questions that you might have popped through in the chat function there. Um, in the meantime, Melissa, Kerry and Irene, feel free to chat some more about some of these amazing uh, programs and groups that you've, you've already mentioned today. Yes. Um, Melissa, would you like to share your pot and, and plot um, species that you recommended? They were quite beautiful and you never quite got to those. So that'd be great to show people. Yep, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. I just need, need you to stop that chat. Oh, yeah, because I was so keen for everyone to have that information. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. As usual, I talked way too fast and, and missed something. <laughs> I do the same thing, Melissa. Just quickly, we have had just, just had a question come through from yep. Linda. Uh, Linda would like to know if they can join uh, the, the Knox one, even though they're in Hobson's Bay. No, I, no, no, sorry. Unfortunately, that's not possible because it's for Knox residents. But I do encourage you to either contact the Gardens for Wildlife Victoria, who are facilitating rolling out uh, programs in other areas. And there may already be community groups or council in that area that are, are about to launch one or are interested in launching one and just wanna know what residents' responses are. That's so fantastic. Thanks, Irene. Um, and I've noticed Barbara's just raised their hand. So Barbara, please feel free to type your question into the chat function there. Um, I've also just had Roslyn ask if um, there is a link to the nature strip permit and where can Roslyn find that one? Yes, um, you would find it on, um, if you Google Knox Green Street, um, you will probably find it. But um, I had that in my um, contact, which we will put up again towards the end. Um, it's in the Knox um, contact that I had their contact bar. So it will yep. be there. But just Google, just Google Knox planting it'll come up I'm sure nature strip planting it will come up on the council Dr yep. Google. Fantastic we'll just take one more question from uh, Barbara before we go ahead with your section yep. Melissa. Um, Barbara is renting in South Morang and would like to know if there's a site for gardens and pots um, or is that maybe asking of a good place to purchase um, to purchase pots from in South, around South, South Morang? Oh, I'm not sure. Yes, sorry, that's outside, way outside of No my... worries. 
we might be able to come back to that, but one more from Alyssa, um, who would like to know if there's any native plants that might uh, detract minor birds and local birds uh, that would love. One of, sorry. Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer this and then the others might have something to too. But um, one of the things that, um, if it's Indian miners, um, they do like it to be very, very open. So that very open garden with wide expanses of grass is something that they really find very attractive. So if you do plant your garden more densely, and in, um, that often is a great uh, uh, assistance. And of course, make sure that you're not, um, if say you've got chickens or things like that, I've found in the past when I used to just throw my chicken feed out, that would bring them in and now I have it contained so that they can't get it. So you, you do have to do some domestic arrangements to make sure that, that you don't make it as attractive as possible for them to come in. What do you, does Melissa or Kerry have anything to add to that? Well, I have a quite a bit of garden around so I don't have much trouble with the uh, miners at all. Uh, the other thing, as you said, Irene, is uh, don't leave any food around, but, uh, otherwise you will attract them. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Barbara has just clarified her question. Um, she was looking for some uh, a resource for native plants in pots. It sounds like that might be covered in Melissa's next section. So um, we'll go to Melissa now and maybe circle back to some questions in another few minutes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Irene asked about Go to plant a go to plant for a pots, which, as I said, there's over 400 species in the local area, so that's a big, massive uh, pool to choose from. So I actually just picked a few plants that I've actually got in my garden right now in pots, and it all really just depends on where you're going to be putting your pot. If it's going to be sunny, shady, get a lot of rain, or if you'd be watering it yourself. Um, so really the best thing to do is to go to your local nursery and just talk to the people there. There may be some differences in the species in your local area. Um, so yeah, just, just go along and they're always happy to answer questions wherever you go really. Um, so these are a couple of my pots. Uh, this is a, a one of our local uh, orchid species. Um, all of our local orchids are terrestrial and they do disappear underground for part of the year. Um, but this one is, is quite decorative. I've got a, a little bird cage over it because the blackbirds like to dig them up. Uh, so it protects them from being all dug up. Um, but it also makes the pot look pretty even when the plants are below ground. Mm -hmm. um, this one's a, a creeping plant called running postman. This is fantastic. You can do all kinds of things with it. You can put it in a hanging basket. I picked up this rusty old wheelbarrow off hard rubbish. Um, it's another good, uh, it's good for drier spots um, and happy in the sun. These ones I just planted all oh, three days ago, <laughs> um, chocolate lilies, but I've actually got a pot at my parents' place. It's probably close to 10 years old and it's the biggest chocolate lily I've ever seen. Um, so they obviously do very nicely in pots. Another a dry sunny spot for that one. This one's also another dry sunny spot. So it's it's good to have those kind of plants because often they're the, the hardest to keep alive, the, the ones in the dry spots in a, on a sunny, hot concrete patio or something. Um, this one did get sat on by a neighbor's cat, so it's grown a little funny, uh, but it's absolutely looking beautiful under my kitchen window. This one's I've got in a little bit of a, a dappled shade spot. It's a pelargonium and Plants in the pelargonium are known to be detracting, to, to detract mosquitoes. So I've popped it by my back door and hoping this particular species also fits that category. And uh, it's got these cute little pink and white flowers. Um, and this one's good for a little bit of a wetter spot. This is in my yet to be planted up fernery, um, but it's, it's gonna be a beautiful feature plant, the uh, tetratheca. Um, so then for go-to plants for pots, I thought I'd just go a bit broad on this one. Um, acacias are a fantastic species for your backyard. They fix nitrogen in your soil. So they're really good for fixing up degraded soil. Um, and they come from in every shape from creeping plants to tall trees. So you can always get what you want. Oleris in the, in the daisy family are absolutely fantastic for attracting insects and look put on a beautiful display. We've got some great ground covers, which are 
fantastic for smothering weeds like our busy widgie here and obviously interest insect attracting as well um and then i thought i'd just showcase my favorite family of all of them is the pea flower family they um absolutely stunning displays you can't go wrong with with a pea flower like this delinea here um yeah that's it from me <laughs> thanks for letting me jump in there again no not a problem it was quite it worked out better than it we organized actually i love these serendipitous things now, I did notice a question about the combinations for the prickly thicket for small birds that I was talking about with the Vesaria and the Coria. And yes, there are many, many um, species, um, indigenous species and even native species that you can use to provide this dense prickly thicket. If you're against prickly plants, there's a lovely Leptospermum continentale. Um, it comes in a number of sizes. There's a, a um, a medium size and then the taller shrub size. That makes an excellent dense foliage or dense screen and then this dense thicket for small birds. So when you're trying to green up a space in your own backyard, planting along a fence line, which as Kerry was talking about before, they've done at Knox Park Primary School. Um, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful way of greening up the space, but also providing small bird habitat. And combining that with a fuchsia, whether it's the indig one or native ones, and there are so many native fuchsias, um, the corias, there are so many of them for any spot. You've then got this fantastic um, plant combination for small birds. Now, the coria is particularly good rather than a grevillea. Now, I'm not against grevilleas. They're great plants and they'll bring birds into the garden. But one of the things that happens is this dominance by even the larger native birds because the grevillea showy flowers um, get these larger birds to want to be very territorial and they'll often drive a, a small bird off. Where the coria, the flowers occur right within the bush which means the little bird can be inside that bush feeding quite safely. And if it does feel threatened, jump into the um, screen. So these are perfect combinations. So I encourage you to look for them and um, do that and green up your own space and also make it small bird friendly. Because in many, many instances, the small birds are also eating a large amounts of insects. Like even the honey eaters eat about 200 insects a day. So that's where you're going to get your controlling of things like mosquitoes and other pest species to occur. So all of this has got great threats in nature for us and for them. So really encourage you to think about doing something like that. Fantastic. Thanks, Irene. We do have a few other questions I'd like to throw to the panel. Um, are there any plants that can help with reduction in downhill erosion is one we had from Andrea. Would you like to take that, Kerry or Melissa? Well, it's a, any plants will do. I'm not sure uh, what your slope's like, but uh, any, any plants that you can get growing there will get their roots into the ground and uh, hold it together. Um, um, you could try to think, yeah, like Grevillea, um, the... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Lamandras, lamandras with the, the loops and dianellas, things that have got really good solid roots that will reach down, as Kerry said. Yes, I, I think, um, yeah, look for something with a really good root structure. And there's yeah. certainly plants that would do that. Uh, another thing too is if you've got a slope that you're getting eroded, you could tear it. So you've got... Um, horizontal levels and steps, and you could plant your uh, lamandras or uh, fence of them to stop, slow down the water flow. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Um, how about some plants that you might recommend to attract other insects like beetles? Um, I think the Illyrias, don't you, Melissa? Um, yeah, Illyrias are great because that open flower um, and I'll, have, I'll say I minded my daughter's dog over last winter while she was away and he, um, the dog's older and had to get up at night to go outside. Oh, my Lord, the beetles that were buzzing me around in my garden at night. It, um, don't forget because we might not see them, but they are very much um, out there at night time. I was even spooked in my own garden and definitely the white flowers are things that attract night flying insects. So think about that so that they can see them in the in the um, lower light levels 
So anything that's got white flowers, I suggest you think about things like that. Um, and yeah, yeah give, give them a go. I think the Illyrias would be a great one. Excellent, thank you. Um, and can any of you tell us if uh, council provide uh, traps for Indian minor birds at all? They do, yeah. yeah? Yep. Okay, no worries. And that information would be available on the council website. That's right, yes. Yeah. Uh, what, one other thing we haven't mentioned that's very important is water in the garden. Uh, you should all have, uh, if you want to keep the birds and other wildlife there, uh, have uh, hanging uh, water uh, utensils, but make sure that they're not in such a situation that a cat can wait to pounce on the bird. And also uh, have some water right down at the ground level you know, for other animals that are around. Yes. Particularly Make sure also that there's a, a stick or a rock or something in the water as well so yeah. no animal can drown in the water or, you know, they've got an escape method or, and even things like bees um, and, and flying insects, they struggle to access the water if it's just a big pool. So they'll need something to stand on and get to the shallower water yeah. to, to actually drink from. Yeah, especially in the very hot weather, uh, I've found that uh, bees will easily drown in, in the water unless you've got, uh, as Melissa said, sticks or a few stones there for them to uh, climb up on. Mm. Um, and just quickly, do we know any resources to maybe find a large log to provide habitat with? Well, that's so interesting because we get um, uh, around here, there's often trees fallen and I'm able to pick up logs. So I tend to do that. Um, do you guys know of any places that you can go to get them other than discarded logs on the side of the road? Melissa, didn't you get one for us from for KES at one stage? No, that wasn't me. Yeah. Um, but a lot of um, tree companies, tree removal companies, um, there are a lot of local ones that are conscious of the environment and will save things like that if you ask them to, because um, yeah. they don't want to chip it because they have to get rid of the chip, the mulch somehow. Yeah. So they yeah. might as well drop off a log to your place, which you can use in your garden. So yeah, yeah. if you ask around, even yeah. Facebook is good. There are local groups are on the marketplace just ask around and there's often people with these things just lying around they don't know what to do with. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I can say is uh, uh, be aware that you don't pick up a large log that's got termites in it. Yeah. Or, or take it out of the of a place that where it's naturally residing. Don't buy any... And I know the kind of people that have subscribed to this talk wouldn't do that, but the worst thing we can do is go back out into these natural places and remove things that wildlife there is already relying on or the natural systems are already relying on. So, And also make sure that the log that you get is healthy log. You don't want to go and pick one up from the neighbourhood that has been diseased or anything like that as well. And the biggest problem I've got is I've got a wonderful husband, but he does get a bit fed up with the amount of times I make him go and get me and carry logs home. But still, I'm sure that's doable, yeah. yeah. And I noticed that we've got some more um, questions coming through too there, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And one, Melissa, in light of your chocolate lily, question um, about here. Um, have you noticed that question, Melissa, about... Yeah, so um, Linda says her chocolate lilies aren't growing well. They get morning sun but seem to be small. Um, so where is the best spot for them? Um, I find with chocolate lilies, um, you need to be careful sometimes when planting them not to disturb their tubers too much. Um, I'm not sure how old your chocolate lilies are, but if they're only one year old, your tubers are probably very small, um, and so your plants will be very small. Mm -hmm. um, so give them a couple years each year, their tubers will grow a little bit bigger each year and get a little stronger and might turn into the, turn into the giant specimens my mum has at her place now. Yes. Um, it also may be if you put it into very thick clay, perhaps the tubers can't grow as quickly or as big as they'd like to. Um, yeah, also um, they do very well if you plant them in amongst things like small tufted grasses. They, they really appreciate like the support 
on their leaves to to grow up between in those intertussic zones um, between the plants. They do really well in those kind of spots. Great. Um, I have a great balcony question from Aileen. Um, Aileen would like to know if you can recommend any Indigenous species that would grow well in low light in a pot on a balcony that might just get a little bit of morning sun. Yes, heaps, there's heaps of species that would do that. I am indig and I noticed that um, that was an Indigenous um, preference as well. I really do recommend that um, if you've got a decent sized pot, there are many species that would be um, would work in that kind of situation. Many plants are used to growing understory in a forest and um, would like that low light and also be appreciating the fact that they haven't got that hot summer sun uh, on a balcony spot. So really the choice is, um, there's just a, such a variety of choice. Would anyone out like to throw in some choices there for Aileen? Because I seem to be chatting on here. <laughs> oh, one would be Tetrasica. Yeah, yeah. Ciliata. Yep, and that was that lovely purple one that Melissa showed, or pink yeah. towards the end of her talk that she's only recently planted to go in her fernery. So that, that would be a lovely plant for that option. And what about you, Melissa? Got a preference there? Oh, as, as you pointed out, Irene, dinellas um, do well in pots. Um, even the, some of the small lamandras look fantastic in pots. Uh, we're in a really good location here in Knox because we've got the benefit of the flatlands down in Knox. The, the, we've got some dry areas and we've got the creek and the swampy areas. Um, but then we've also got the, the Dandenong Ranges. Um, so we've got such a huge variety of plants that grow in the full sun to full shade to wet to dry. We've got literally everything um, you can pop, every possible combination you can think of. So yeah, there really is a lot of options um, for those spots. You just need to ask the right questions, I guess. Fantastic. Yeah. We've, had a, we've had a similar question um, to the balcony question, but for a more exposed balcony, so hot summers and cold nights as well, maybe something a bit more um, hearty. Yeah. Um, Kerry, you might have some in your native plants um, information that might be really suitable for that kind of a spot. Uh, well, I think anything is, it's just a matter of, uh, if they're in a pot, they're well drained, and it's just a matter of uh, uh, make sure that uh, you fill the pot with a native uh, potting mix uh, because it uh, uh, has very low amounts of phosphorus in it, which a lot of natives don't like. And it's a matter of uh, don't let the uh, pot dry out. So uh, there's so many uh, plants that will uh, grow in that situation as long as you care to their uh, water and food needs. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's really hot or, uh, or really cold. Uh, yeah, even will corias would be good, wouldn't they? Some lovely colourful corias would be good in that one, the Coria Dusky Bells. That's... Yeah. That will take quite a severe spot, won't it? I remember your... Yes, yeah, it's very hardy. Very hardy. So Coria Dusky Bells, that's one of the native fuchsias that we were discussing as part of a small bird habitat. But it's a lovely hardy one and we'll take that kind of a, a rough house. And then another pot to consider there would be, again, your lamandras because that's mm. um, they're quite tough and there's such a range of them now with such interesting form. And I could imagine, you know, two or three pots on a balcony mass together with the Coria, maybe the Lamandra, the Dianella, or even something a little bit higher, like one of the, um, the Leptospermum, the tea tree. So you've got your small bird habitat happening, even a little bit of native bee habitat happening, and who knows who you might get to visit. So the Leptospermum was the tea tree that I was talking about. Well, that comes in a mid-range height, and so I'm sure it would probably grow quite well in a pot. So you never know, you might just strike that you in the right place, connect it up to others that are doing it. And that's what it's often about, you know, because I would love to get more small birds in my garden. I've got so much prickly thicket, I'm in danger of my prints never being able to find me. But, um, because, but um, no small birds visit my property because they're dominated by the larger birds. And I just don't have enough around me. There's too big of a 
a separation between me and the next property. But you never know once you start doing that on your balcony and encourage others nearby to do it. Before long, you've got this connectivity and you might have a small bird visiting your balcony. Fantastic. Um, we've had another question about Indian miners. We've got um, Anitha or Anitha, who's curious to know um, what the Indian miners do and, and why they might be considered an issue in your garden. Did, who wants to take that? Do you, would you go? They, they can be uh, a very aggressive bird and uh, they'll keep other uh, birds out. They'll even uh, kill uh, small possums. You know, so they're not a very welcome bird. They're mm. very, uh, very smart bird too. And uh, as I said, there's only two ways you can either uh, uh, catch them in a cage and uh, humanely uh, euthanize them or as Irene suggested have a very built up garden which discourages them. Yeah and the issue with Indian miners and why they've been no uh, nominated as a feral species is Indian miners have um, originated in another continent um, in association with their habitat but they're extremely successful when they've come into Australia to the detriment of our own species. It's not like they're taking up a small niche. They're actually out competing the local species and the native species for not just habitat, um, but also, as Kerry said, um, preying on smaller birds and other animals and actually compromising um, the viability long-term of our own indigenous or native species. And one of, that's one of the really big reasons why Gardens for Wildlife in Knox originated was try to just redress some of this out of balance kilter for nature that now exists in Knox. And we have that opportunity not to, um, not, not to uh, want to exterminate species necessarily, but to redress the balance. And that's what it's all about. And when something becomes feral, it's actually about them dominating and um, over, overturning the balance of nature. It's very interesting. Thanks, Irene. Um, we've just got one more question left for the day. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so we've had a really similar question about snails and what snails might do to your plants and how you might be able to get rid of them as well. Wow, what might they do with snails? They eat all your, your little seedlings. There aren't native species of snails. I, I admit that I do see them fairly, um, not very, very often, because often with the native species, when you consider that Australian soils are that very shallow and very old and very poor, the species that have lived here naturally have always been not, not as flourishing, if you like, as some of the European species because they can only live in sync within what, what resources are available. But um, introduced species are often very, if they ha have been successful in Australia and even the introduced snails are because they are incredibly able to dominate and, and be successful and start to feed on things way outside of their natural range. So from a snail's point of view in your garden, I do see them as the enemy and I'm almost a Buddhist in my approach of not wanting to harm things. I'll put a spider outside, but as a gardener, I'm afraid I have been known to stand on snails because they will eat anything and everything in the garden. Um, and uh, basically I, I don't really like poisons. So I did do with, deal with them manually. What about you, Melissa or... Um, I think your name, Kerry. Kerry. <laughs> a lot of our local plants are, and even a lot of the natives are, a bit tougher than your your introduced garden favourites and your vegetables and herbs. Um, so they're not as susceptible to the the invasive snails. And obviously, they've grown up, they've come up alongside indigenous plants over hundreds of years. So that's normal for them to be in balance. Um, and it is good to have some snails because you things like your, your blue tongue lizards will eat them. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess it's just a matter of keeping balance and, and keeping on top of the, the introduced ones that are going to munch on your veggies. Okay, thank you very much. That is unfortunately all we have time for today. Um, sorry to cut that one short. 
Um, so thank you all so much to our wonderful panelists, Irene, Kerry, and Melissa, and for all of you for attending today's workshop as well and for your wonderful questions. They've been fantastic. Um, and we've got the contact information back up on the screen for if you're interested to take a screenshot there. Um, now the Stringy Bark Virtual Festival will be live on Facebook until nine o'clock tonight. There's heaps of great content on there if you'd like to have a look on the Knox Arts and Events Facebook page. Um, the next workshop is up in 10 minutes. Uh, it's called The Age Old Art of Preserving. So check that one out if you're interested. Um, the recording from today's session will be available after the festival as well. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed this workshop brought to you by Knox Arts and Events. Please stay online for just a moment uh, to take a survey that will pop up on your screen. But for goodbye for now and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank goodbye. You. Thanks for your questions. Bye. Bye. Bye.